All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive, home of the Name Your Price tool. You say how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote. Visit Progressive.com to get started. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, January 22nd, 1977, President Jimmy Carter in his first full day in office, actually on the 21st, um, on his first full day in office, he fulfilled one of his most notable and most controversial campaign promises, granting unconditional pardon to hundreds of thousands of men who had evaded the draft during the Vietnam War. This was, of course, less than two years after the U.S. finally pulled out of Vietnam, still a very raw moment for this country, and no surprise, this particular issue very very contentious, very heated, and Carter takes it on on day one. So here to discuss the draft dodger pardon, all the sort of politics and emotion and all the other things swirling around this really fascinating moment are, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. I should also add for me, we'll get to this later, but you know, part of the framing for me is just What it means for a president to come in and have to clean up a previous president's Mm. mess, which is something I've been thinking about a little bit. Uh, Mm. But uh, can't imagine why it's on your mind. (laughs) uh, You know, every president has to do it. And I think, you know, Carter, Mm. I think, knew what he was getting himself into, which I think is a big part of this story as well and a really fascinating part of the story. But there's one interesting wrinkle here, Nikki, that maybe we can start with, which is I'm using the word pardon. That is the sort of way this is portrayed. There's another word. Amnesty. And I think amnesty versus pardon and the nature of this act is a big part of what lets us understand what was really taking place here. So what is your what is your sense of that? Well, so Carter actually says in one of the presidential debates what he means when he says pardon versus amnesty. He says amnesty means that what you did was right. Pardon means that what you did, whether it's right or wrong, you are forgiven for it. Um, And I think that that is an interesting parsing. It's also important to note that amnesty had become a more politically toxic word. It was one of those words that was just kind of neutral. Amnesties had been given by presidents throughout history for various things. But in the 1972 election, Richard Nixon starts talking about the Democratic Party as the party of acid amnesty and abortion. And during that period, amnesty becomes an attack word. And so Carter is distancing himself from it. Now, pardon is also not necessarily the favorite word of the American people. The previous president had come in and the first thing he had done Mm -hmm. was grant a pardon, except that was one directly to one person, Richard Nixon. Mm. So much about this moment is just like, I think about, well, maybe because I'm always thinking about the 19th century, but I think about like how fugitive slaves ran to Canada's border to like Mm -hmm. get safety. And so much about this moment too is about the relationship between the United States and Canada, because this is not just like an in-house okay we'll pardon everyone but this is really like an international diplomacy issue as well when you think about the the numbers of people that not just left but went to one particular place uh and saw canada as a refuge i think is also a part of this conversation yeah and when we talk about people who 
didn't fight in Vietnam and evaded the draft for, you know, there's a lot of levels and nuance to that too. And so there's people who flee to Canada, which is really fascinating. You know, hundreds of thousands and a lot of them settled permanently in Canada. There's people who, you know, took stands and burned their draft cards or were conscientious yeah. objectors. And then there were people who worked the system. And I think that was a lot of people. And there was a lot of animosity about that and people mm-hmm. who were in a, in a position of privilege to get deferments or go to school or all these other things. And so, you know, there's just this swirl, mm-hmm. both um, in terms of the emotion and the politics of it, but then also the complexity of when you try and make a law like this and pass a law like this, what does it actually address and in what mm-hmm. way? And I mean, I think you read some of the coverage of this it's, it almost makes you think that Carter had, I mean, look, this is a, he's, he's going right into a really tough issue here. Yeah. He almost sort of had, had it the worst of all ways, which is all of the sort of vitriol around this fell down on him. Mm. But, you know, the actual law itself was maybe some descriptions of it are fairly narrow and technocratic and maybe didn't sort of cover. Um, and so, you know, I guess one question here is how much is mm. this a symbolic thing and a thing to try and move forward? And how much is this more a logistical thing of like, well, we can't. We can't have it on the books that all these people, when they come back from Canada, have to get have to go to jail or have to have yeah. mandatory military service. So we got to sort of figure out how to figure out the nuts and bolts of this. So I don't think it was that much of a logistical issue. I do think it was a moving forward issue. The U.S. has never had problems arresting people and throwing them in jail, um, particularly around the borders. Um, but this idea that the Vietnam War had been so contentious the majority of Americans believed that it was the wrong thing to do. Hundreds of thousands of lives in the United States had been disrupted. Tens of thousands of Americans had been killed. And there was just this sense of exhaustion. By 77, right, the war had also been lost. Not only had the U.S. withdrawn, but um, South Vietnam had fallen to North Vietnam. And trying to put a bow on it and put it in the past was a really important thing that the United States needed to do and that Carter just did it first thing um, is is kind of remarkable. Yeah, mm. it's closure for a lot of people. It's, it's closure. But I mean, it's it's not it's still not complete because the wounds of Vietnam are still fresh for some people. You know, I mean, they will never go away. But I don't know. I applaud Carter for making an extraordinary decision to say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to move forward. And yes, I know there'll be critics on both sides of this. um, But it's the right thing to do. And I don't think he was wrong about that. In some ways, I think that's what he's most remembered for. Huh? Yeah, I I, I hold that thought for one sec, because I do think it's so fascinating to think of how much should this make a, you know, how much should this be the first sentence when you talk about Jimmy Carter? Mm. But, you know, there was this healing moment, this attempt by Carter to take a really tough position and and fulfill a campaign promise, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And there were really difficult conversations. There was also a ton of political opportunism, no surprise. You know, Senator Barry Goldwater called it, quote, the most disgraceful thing a president has ever done. Do our two historians have any thoughts about the (laughs) most disgraceful things a president has ever done? Uh, Especially three (laughs) years after Watergate? (laughs) No, I was like, um... Yeah, the, That's the not direct, even the top 10. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the director of the Veteran of Foreign Wars described it as, quote, sadder than Watergate or Vietnam itself, uh, what? you know, this act. And so, you know, and, and the general public, I think, was was mixed because it was, you know, because also there was such a difficult conversation about what do we do with people who actually fought, you know, and we were starting to neglect them and never really took care of, of, of them and the people who had actually gone and fought this disgraceful war. So, you know, it was just stepping right into such a such a difficult issue being dealt and then choosing to play a hand that you were never really going to win. Yeah, I think about someone like my dad who was drafted to Vietnam in 67, 68 and never wanted to be in the military, never talked about his military service afterwards and yet went. Right. And so somebody like him would feel resentful that there were people who just left and mm-hmm. got to have their lives back and not disrupted in the way that that he did. Yeah. Yeah, my uncle also was drafted and hated the military. Hated it. And in some ways he conceded that it gave him as a black man a different mm-hmm. set of opportunities than he had in Detroit. But at the same time, it was not a good experience. And so um I think a lot of people are having to reconcile, not just with those who decided not to 
sign up but like those who enlisted and who fought or or enlisted fought and then later deserted or whatever there's a lot of complications that go into people's military experiences that's not accounted for within this pardon yeah yeah um some of the numbers here a a couple hundred thousand people men were formally accused of violating draft laws there's estimates that another 350 400 thousand were never formally accused um this order would was you know it was a little unclear how many people would affect but some people thought that it would be really you know close to half a million people would be sort of affected by this this pardon in some way let's go back to the canada thing it's very fascinating you know a number this was one of the moves was to was to go to canada to of evade the draft um i didn't realize this but you know a good number of people who went to canada ended up settling there permanently yeah 90 percent of the people who leave the united states go to canada and about fifty thousand people uh wind up staying there and and i, I suppose eventually becoming citizens there um and canada is not mad because they're like you know what actually nope. <laughs> we can use the labor <laughs> we can use either hi- highly skilled labor these are um highly educated men that are often um coming to canada's borders and so because they had a, a labor shortage it actually worked in in canada's favor to have this influx of men the uh, CBC at the time did an interview with one of the men who was actually staying in Canada. He had Canadian citizen by the time this citizenship by the time this pardon came down, um, and he said, "You know, I'm I'm going to stay. Um, I'm going to raise my kids here." But the pardon meant something to him because it meant that the way that he talked about it was he was like, "You know, I can go back to the United States yeah. and see like the Grand Canyon." You know, there are all sorts of cool things to see in the U.S. My kids can go to the U.S. and know that part of their heritage. So it was it was interesting to see how even the people who stayed um, got something out of the pardon. Yeah. And that's such a good point. There were there were there's all these stories in the you know 70s and then into the 80s of people being able to come back and see their family and return. And, and you know, either, if they come back, you know, a lot of these are people who have lived a activist life or, you know, and a lot of them have come back and taken up issues that were, were rising in the 80s and so forth. So it's just this interesting infusion back and forth of this group. Um, you know, and this wasn't something that just was an issue in Carter's presidency or in the late 70s or even, in, or even into the 80s. I mean, I just think throughout my political life, the question of what did you do in Vietnam mm. has been lingered and has lingered all the mm-hmm. way through to today and every single president since Carter has kind of had to face that question um all of them got out of serving in one way or another yeah. basically Mil- right? military service comes up with every president you know did did you serve yes or no um and with Bill Clinton with George Bush with Dan Quayle with Dick Cheney none of them ever broke any draft laws I think that's a important to note but all of them have sort of evaded combat Mm -hmm. you know like the the hardcoreness of of the military it's well known that trump you know gets a a draft deferment not once not twice but five times um once because of like bone spurs in his feet or something like that but i mean there are lots of ways that people manipulated or maneuvered around these sort of like holes in the system but yeah, it's something that comes up all the time. Like, how good of a leader can you be if you've never seen combat or never served your country? Yeah. And this was a big question even at the time. I mean, do you, you'll remember that. Um, is it Creedence Clearwater Revival song, Fortunate Son? Or sure. was it Joe? Yeah. And that idea that people who had connections didn't have to serve, that it was essentially a poor man's war. And the resentments that piled up around that, I mean, you get both the accusations of somebody like George Bush, you know, here's somebody who's well connected and can just get out of it. And then somebody like Bill Clinton, who does use his political connections to get out of serving in the war. But the way that he was portrayed as this hippie anti-war activist and draft dodger, I feel like his his run in 92 in particular was one where that phrase was lobbied around as a political yeah. attack throughout the campaign, particularly because he's running against George H.W. Bush, who was a well known for his service in World War II. And it also gets racialized because someone oh, like absolutely. Muhammad Ali, who does, who would, you would say has the social clout, the fame in order to perhaps maneuver around this, can't do that. And he has to make this 
his political stance of of using this as a moment to say no listen i'm not going i'm not going to fight consequences be damned you know and he doesn't get an opportunity to sort of maneuver his way out of this yeah yeah, he loses the prime of his his boxing career because of it, among mm-hmm. other ramifications. Um, but you bring up Ali; it is a funny little coda to all of this. That when it, uh, this question of pardoning Vietnam uh, draft evaders uh, came up recently with Donald Trump, because he tried to do what? <laughs> he tried to repardon. <laughs> he tried to repardon Muhammad Ali. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Why? Why? listeners, you will be forgiven if you if you lost this little moment and all the other things that happened during the Trump era. But yes, he tried. He had this notion that, oh, I should pardon Muhammad Ali. This will be a good look for me. And, you know, someone had to gently tap him on the shoulder and be like, well, Jimmy Carter already kind of took care of that in 1977. Um, a little late. Just yeah, a little yeah. late. Yeah. Um, all right. Muhammad uh, Ali is being pardoned more and more these days. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Carter. He called this the single hardest decision of his campaign. How much? We've talked about Jimmy Carter a number of times on this show. Um, you know, I think a presidency that in many ways was just sort of stuck in the mud um, from the beginning. How much should this be part of that Jimmy Carter story? Because I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem to me like when people sum up the Carter presidency, the first thing they say is, well, from day one, he put himself in this just really awful position because of this one one act. But it seems to me like it gets at all the, the things that feel like led to Carter's presidency being stuck in some way. It's also just an expression of Jimmy Carter's, the morality that he brought to politics. Like he thought that it, there were political incentives as well, but it seemed like the right thing to do. And Jimmy Carter was always going to do what he thought was the right thing to do, even if it cost him. But, it, you know, as far as his presidency being stuck in the mud, look at the polls around this, how split people were over the pardon. And it, it reminds you that Jimmy Carter came into office with a very divided country mm-hmm. and had to clean up all of these messes. And those messes cost him that cleanup cost him a lot of political capital. And it did yeah. um, limit the rest of his presidency. But there were much larger forces at play that were that limiting factor. But can I just say that, like, I love Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Maybe it's because I, I, there's so much about him that I think is endearing. But I think that's become his mo you know he's a good man like yeah. that's how we see him as the as the sunday school teacher as the person that has compassion that is what i think about when i think of carter i don't think of someone who's power hungry i don't think of like some military mogul or whatever i think of you know this is just a nice sweet man that wants to do right by people and his trying his darndest like that is the (laughs) that may be bad but that's you know there are worse ways to be thought of as a president so yeah yeah it's just uh, just a question of how much actual political capital does that does that image buy you and how much of a leash do you have you know it's tough but yeah yeah. um all right well that brings us to the end of the episode nicole hammer thanks to you thank you jody and kelly carter jackson thanks to you my pleasure Right. Now, I, I don't advocate amnesty. I advocate pardon. Amnesty means that that you uh, what, that what you did was right. Pardon means that what you did, whether it's right or wrong, you're forgiven for it. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. If you'd like to support the show and the network directly, we can't do this show without you. You can do so at our website, thisdaypod.org. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Kala Nakua helps with transcripts. Special thanks to Julie Shapiro and Audrey Murdovich, executive producers at Radiotopia, and special thanks to the whole team at Radiotopia and PRX. Get in touch if you have any questions or comments or ideas for topics on the show or special guests that you would like us to have on. You can email us thisdaypod at gmail.com or you can find a form at thisdaypod.com. On our website, you can also get full archives, transcripts, and learn lots more about the show. Follow us on social media at This Day Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We're posting lots of stuff each and every day. This is my obligatory please rate and review us in your favorite podcast app, or better yet, just tell a friend about the show. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.
Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Radiotopia. From P. Peace-